<coughs> okay. Where's my hair? Okay. Where's my hair? Oh, it's beautiful. Mm. Du, 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 du. Welcome to Obscurama, yeah! <sighs> You're really bad at these intros. Uh, this is... Uh this is my best yet. Okay. So, today we talk about 2011's Kill List, directed by Ben Wheatley. A man I met once at Fest. <laughs> Almost I, met. I did meet. Uh, I, I guess we'll get to that anecdote mm. later. Yeah. Uh, Kill List is an occult thriller in which two hit men do a series of missions that take them further and further towards the edge of reason and sanity. Mm -hmm. Spoilers, lots of spoilers. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, do people watch these if they haven't seen the film? Well, if you really, truly haven't, I would suggest you don't watch any more of this and go and watch it. It's an excellent film with lots of twists and surprises, so mm -hmm. you don't want to spoil it. Yeah. Tom says it's Ben Wheatley's only good film, so you especially <laughs> want to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a really interesting filmmaker as mm -hmm. well as a film. So let's talk a little bit about Ben Wheatley first. Right. Um, ben Wheatley, for me, came into prominence with Kill List. Mm. This is a low budget film. and. If you're an independent filmmaker, I recommend watching it for that reason. It's so stripped back and yet is so powerful mm -hmm. and dense, you know, with, with lots of wonderful things. This film was followed by A Field in England. Mm -hmm. Another really remarkable film. Or was it Sightseers? I can't remember. Yeah. One of those, but A Field in England, yeah. These are both films that Ben Wheatley collaborated with uh, with his wife, Amy Jump, mm -hmm. as well. And together they make a formidable creative team. And then there was High Rise. Mm. That's when things started to go a little bit rocky uh, for Ben. Mm -hmm. Jesus and Christ, be then after that, things went away. bad to worse. Mm -hmm. With Free Fire, I think it's Free called. Free Fire, yeah. Yeah, which was a kind of fuck you to the critics that Ben Wheatley uh, wanted to do. Yeah. Um, after High Rise didn't do as well as, as he had hoped. He had his famous quote that critics are, his famous quote that I can't remember verbatim, um, but went something along the lines of, critics, you're shit because you can't make films. Which, it's true, but you can't say that, Ben. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, he attempted to do this uh, quite literally with his film Free Fire, which was a kind of meta 70s action comedy. The kind of, it seemed more like the kind of film that a totally different filmmaker would make. Yeah. Um, he is rumoured to be direct or was rumoured to be director for a new Tomb Raider film and now is currently linked with The Meg 2. Go figure. Yeah. What you're seeing is, I think... Uh, oh, John has got some information for us. Free Fire was followed by Happy New Year, Colin Burstead. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. That's the... Kind that was the Channel 4 Type 1. Yeah. TV show, three episodes called Strange Angel. Uh, oh, nobody saw the TV show Strange Angel. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, Rebecca. So, to understand what the experience of watching Rebecca is like, uh, the adaptation of the, 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 the amazing, uh, oh, is it it's Daphne du Maurier yeah, novel? Yeah, Daphne uh, du Maurier. The, the amazing Daphne du Maurier, um, directed beautifully by Alfred Hitchcock with uh, Laurence Olivier and... Um, was it Catherine Hepburn, I think that was that? Um, I think it was Catherine Hepburn. Um, that was good, but Ben Wheatley's is bad. And I say this with, with lots of love and respect to Ben Wheatley. He's a great filmmaker, Kill List, and I feel in England are better than anything I'll ever make. 
but his rendition of Rebecca was like squatting over a blender and teabagging it whilst it's plugged into the wall. Not a pleasant Eight experience. Eight out of ten. <laughs> it was so horrendous that I wanted to cheese grate my eyeballs. No, I haven't seen it, so. Throw my mushed in eyes with my mushed in genitals in that blender. So you can kind of tell what we're saying here. You know, he's, he's, he's had a sort of a checkered, uneven career and it seems to be not getting any better. It peaked, yeah. Yeah, it, it peaked with these smaller art-driven films mm. and has really struggled with that. And don't get me wrong, me and Tom, we like our popcorn movies mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. You know, I like action films, horror films. You know, I am a horror filmmaker. Um, but it feels like after the success of Kill List and A Field in England and the f struggle of High Rise, that Ben Wheatley has been flailing to try and gain success in spheres that will not see him be critically judged mm. in the same way that triggered that famous quote um, and, and strong reaction at a press conference that followed um, High Rise's difficulties. And he's not quite found it because, of course, people can be critical of action films, yeah. especially if they're not made by people that are just action directors, you know? That's why Ben Wheatley doing The Meg 2 is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although I'm sure um, The Rock, is it The Rock? Hudson, Dwayne Johnson that is in the, mm. the Meg, or is it Jason Statham? I think I it's Jason remember. Statham. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he will get the best out of Jason Statham mm -hmm. that we've seen. And then he'll be able to shuffle back to Channel 4 and then they'll give him some money to make mm. a weird quaoxic film set in a you know council estate. Okay. So, so please be sure to like and subscribe. <laughs> Kill List. Okay, so Kill List, we're at the greatness though. Mm -hmm. um, when did you first see Kill List and how did it affect you? <laughs> My psychiatrist here. I saw it, I think I saw it about a year after it came out. I didn't really know, I knew nothing about it. Um, I, I, don't, I can't even remember what, who recommended to me. I think I might have seen the trailer and gone, because Kill List suggests that it's going to be a straightforward action flick, which is kind of the point, I suppose. But um, I think when they showed the occult symbols in the trailer, I was like, okay, this might be good. Mm. I probably just read an article and it said it was really good and I watched it. And I did watch it and uh, I... It was so... It, the, the intensity just kept building and building and building. I'd I, it's very rare to experience a film where everything is building to one pivotal point, like, so brilliantly. Like it just keeps escalating and escalating, and I, it was it was really memorable experience experience watching it for the first time, because um, yeah, I had no idea what was going to happen and no idea where it was going, and it was really shocking. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my experience was quite similar. I missed the first ten minutes of the film. I caught it when it was playing on television. Mm. And it was actually during the production for The Unkindness of Ravens, a film that was attempting also to be a stripped back psychological folk horror film, mm. which is of course what you know, Kill List is. So wh when I began watching it, just during some downtime at the end of shooting, I was totally absorbed. And it actually ended up inspiring me to tweak my direction of The Unkindness mm. of Ravens. So it was so good that even just watching it, it was affecting me as an artist. Mm. I was changing and evolving my, my own work to try and incorporate some of the lessons mm -hmm. that Ben Wheatley was teaching me in Kill List. Mm. Um, and so, you know, have, make no doubts, you know, we are great admirers of Ben Wheatley's accomplishment with mm. Kill List. Um, the suspense that builds as our hitmen do their missions, a suspense that builds as each mission becomes more and more peculiar and, yeah. and esoteric, does build a sense of palpable dread that brings us to this 
great occult finale mm. that I still did not expect. No. Not played out like that. It placed that film among the, the great lexicon of powerful occult chillers mm. with, with incredible last act changes. Yeah. Almost comparable to films such as The Wicker Man mm. as well. Just for that pulling the rug under your feet kind of finale. Yeah. And I actually think it's very rare that I've watched a film that created such a strange sense of disorientation and dread. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, a, it's even, it's, it's kind of weird because it's very similar to Hereditary in mm -hmm. a weird way, in that all of these things are plotting to, you know, there's all this behind the scenes occult activity trying to influence one character and uh, and it, it kind of works. Uh, it kind of works much better in terms of that. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just the British thing of of occult and folk horror. Yeah. Well, I mean, in in America, it's often Satanism. Mm. Is, is uh, although we're seeing more folk horror emerging, mm. especially with the works of Ari Aster mm. in the state side. But yeah, um, it very much feels like it's in keeping with the tradition of British folk horror. Mm. Um, but it, it still carves its own niche and if you watch it you will very quickly want to watch more of Ben Wheatley's films yeah. and I feel in England it's a great follow-up. Yeah, it's amazing. And then you go off a cliff. Mm. Well, maybe <laughs> Sightseers as well, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's an interesting one. Mm. That. It's kind of a comedy more than anything else. But, uh, yeah. A field in England is fantastic. So when we look at Kill List, right, and we think what helps it to accomplish this, this strangeness, this dread, one of the things we have to credit is the incredible performances which mm -hmm. employ naturalism yeah. in the most unnatural circumstances. Mm -hmm. Lots we, of improv. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have Neil Maskell mm -hmm. um, playing the, our lead, the, the hitman. Jay and his friend, played by Michael Smiley. Mm. And these are both two ex-soldiers who have already done some pretty dark things, or at least that's what's alluded to, mm. uh, who have since become private hitmen, like military, they've been military contractors for a while, and now they've become hitmen. Mm -hmm. And the film presents itself as a gangster kind of thriller. Yeah, a domestic drama as well, yeah. almost at the very start. Because Neil Maskell's trying to balance his career, his dark career, with his marriage and bringing up his son. Yeah, he's traumatized from a, from a previous experience and he hasn't been back at work since. And his wife is basically, they're having huge arguments with each other. Uh, the wife is well played by a Swedish actress. Mayanna Burring. Mayama. Mayanna Burring. Mayanna Burring. Mayanna yeah. or Mayanna. Yeah, she's great as well. Mm -hmm. you know, she makes it all credible. So our hitmen get a very peculiar client played by Strenuous Strenuous. Yeah, something like that. Strenuous Strenuous. Oh, John's reaching for the phone. We will get the correct name to you soon. He's got a great presence as well. Oh, he does. He's amazing. He's, he was the original Three-Eyed Raven in Game of Thrones before he was recast with Max von Sydow. Really? Mm -hmm. It was Max von Sydow that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so it was. Yeah. So. So the, uh, excellent, strange, uncanny atmosphere. Mm. And why is that? Well, the first mission that our, our uh, characters have to undertake has a victim that is surprisingly willing mm -hmm. to die. Yeah. And as they do their missions, things just get stranger and stranger. Mm. Nothing goes quite according to plan. Oh, I think we have a name now. Struan Roger. Struan Roger, okay. Struan Roger. Mm -hmm. We Hello, Mr. Roger. <laughs> we also have some very simple practical effects techniques, but done exceptionally well, mm -hmm. that really sent a shudder down my spine. Mm. One of them being the hammer execution. A oh, horrible. Yeah, when the hammer hits one of our victims in the head. Yeah, there's no music either as well. It's just horrible screams. <laughs> it's really bad. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly done. Yeah. And for independent filmmakers, it shows the, the sheer simplicity yeah. of what you can do production-wise to employ amazing audience reaction. Yeah, and it's not done in a 
you know, a dungeon or anything like that. It's just done in a kitchen, you know, so it's just like a weird juxtaposition of violence and That's right. Kill List is shockingly domestic mm. and suburban. Mm. Even our hitmen have to kind of travel like travelling salesmen going yeah. to Milton Keynes, staying in like a premier inn yeah, yeah. and things like that. It's banal. Everything is presented as banal, mm. which builds magnificently to the last act where mm. everything will change on that score. Mm. We also have some very interesting dialogue as well. I mean, yeah. most of the film, or a lot of the film, is improvised. Mm -hmm. Great for the naturalism, mm -hmm. but they have some great, um, great lines. One particular sequence I enjoy is in a scene where Neil Maskell is observing a bonfire, mm. and he talks about how they deserve to die. Yeah, these are bad people, Cal. They deserve to die. These are bad people, Cal. They deserve to die. And the delivery of Neil Maskell yeah. with that, He's and, so good. and the music as yeah. well, is. Yeah. He's such a good actor and like very powerful and very intimidating and you just believe him like as a person. The success of Kill List made him something of a darling I think at Channel 4 mm. and he became the lead for a short-lived series Utopia. Mm. Uh, but of course, you know, I had Channel 4 semen all over it and it was kind of doomed, mm. you know, despite Neil Maskell's best efforts. Mm -hmm. There's always something about British television, you know, it has a, it's like a Doctor Who type thing. It's when it starts to love itself that it becomes really annoying. It's because the British TV establishment operates in such a kind of self-masturbatory bubble mm. that everything slips off and nothing sticks. Yeah. And um, so that was a shame. It was a shame. It was a shame. What's Neil Maskell doing now? Is he? He's probably making tea. Probably making tea. He's serving the breakfast at the Premier Inn in Milton Keynes. So you can always ask him, kill yeah. this trivia when he's making your selection of bacon or egg combinations. Uh, I can't wait for you to meet Neil Maskell. <laughs> Neil Maskell's <laughs> going to kick my ass. I'm going to fucking kill you. Yeah, he could kill me mm. very easily. Um, Michael Smiley is brilliant. I mm -hmm. think he's great. He's um, very charming. He's very much needed in that role. Otherwise, it would be an incredibly dour, depressing film. Yeah. He's like, and it's not that he's comic relief or anything like that. He's just, he plays so well against uh, Jay, Neil Maskell's character. Um, and they're very believable friends. Like, they're, they don't do anything, you know, stupid or contrived. They're just like, they look like best pals. And they, he's very needed in the film. Godard said that to make a good movie, all you need is a woman and a gun. Mm -hmm. And Kill List kind of shows that. Mm. You know, we have so much improvisation, mm. a couple of gun props, and apart from the last act where it gets a, a you know, higher production value, you could easily have still made a satisfying film with the same limited resources, yeah. I think. Uh, although it's good the way that it does end. I wonder how much the budget was, actually. I'm curious. Well, I mean... It's also relative, mm. you know, yeah, depending on um, how it was all financed. But the thing is, an independent filmmaker could make a film like that yeah, for probably like 15 grand or yeah. something. That's um, very true. Half a million pounds. Whoa. Half a million pounds, yeah, uh, for, that's what John says, half a million pounds for tax purposes. But, <laughs> but for <laughs> practical purposes, who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's say considerably lower. Um, the soundtrack is min is very minimalist. It's strings, it's great. Based. It's, uh, it's strings and percussion. Mm. So lots and lots of strange percussive sounds and lots of uh, snares, kind of rapping. It's very very good. It's uh, and that's actually one of the things that really makes it like a, another level up. Is it kind of reminiscent of some of the music for The Shining? Yes, very good mm. point. They, it is very similar to The Shining, you know. Um, lots of crashing noises and stuff like that. And Often used in unexpected places mm. as well. It kind of creates a, a disorientating and uncomfortable um, emotional experience, which might sound like a bad thing for your entertainment with a film, but for something like this, uh, where it's taking you on a path towards a very dark, and strange outcome mm -hmm. does overall make it more entertaining in yeah. effect. Mm -hmm. um, I also like the editing as well. The editing, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's kind of almost 50% of the intensity of the whole thing. It's just, 
it's some somewhere halfway through the film the editing just changes up and then everything just starts getting faster and faster and faster i know that that's not a new technique but it, it just really ratchets it up and then you've you've got the um which is a kind of a bit no it's not i don't think it is postmodern but they have the um the title cards the cap the chapters done up and it's mm -hmm. according to who's on the list yeah. which i think is kind of kind of very uh bold and, and that could easily come across as pretentious yeah. wankery yeah uh, not uncommon among some a24 films yeah like the green knight but <laughs> But in this, it actually works mm. really well. Yeah. And it shows that there is a place for it if you have the artistic substance mm -hmm. to carry the whole film on and yeah. to do it with such little production value. Yeah. The, the editing as well, um, when combined with the cinematography, which is documentary-like, it's mm -hmm. handheld, it feels like you're watching a fly-on-the-wall documentary or someone almost if I say filming on a phone, it's not to suggest the quality of the cinematography is poor, it's very, it's very attractive, it's rich, but just the compositions and the movements, yeah. it feels like you're always on their shoulders mm -hmm. or you're always with them. It gives it a sense of authenticity mm -hmm. that makes the disturbing experiences feel all the more authentic. Yeah, it's very, it gets very, very uncomfortable towards the end, like gets just claustrophobic especially with the action and pursuit mm -hmm. sequences as well it has a bit of action and then mm. a kind of ritualistic finale that yeah. it's very disturbing mm -hmm. and I think implants the film on the memories of many viewers yeah. long afterwards mm -hmm. definitely so we love the acting we love the weird story mm -hmm. we love the music the cinematography mm -hmm. it's not an expensive film, uh, bar the number of extras in the final act. Mm. But I think for independent filmmakers, it should be on the syllabus. Yeah. Um, because that last act is interchangeable with any scenes with lesser people. And I know for me, it has a genuine influence on The Unkindness of Ravens, which I was fortunate enough to tell Ben Wheatley in person mm. when I was having a drink with him, chatting idly as one filmmaker to another. Uh, to fight fast, Glasgow about in the point five seconds before he was whisked away. I know. I was chatting to Ben Wheatley, and then um, Paul McAvoy from Fight Fest, a, a good friend of mine who run, runs Fight Fest with Ian Rattray and others, came along like a fiend. He, he had to go. He had to scoop him up. There was a, a thing going on in one of the screens, so. It was unfortunate, and I, wa I had the pleasure of watching it from a distance, and just like Laurie's face going, Ooh. It was because I had told a joke that was quite absurd, <sighs> but then, just as I was about to deliver the punchline, mm. he got whisked, which meant all I delivered to him was what sounded like an absurd story slash statement, mm -hmm. with no <laughs> revelation that it was a joke or anything like yeah. that. To my dying day, Thanks to Paul McAvoy, I'll be left with that social faux pas, that embarrassment. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. But I actually think that disturbing event <laughs> is the reason Ben Wheatley struggled with mm. High Rise and then went yeah. into a period of decline. I think that was after High Rise. Was it? Yeah. Anyway, so for, for the purposes of this, sure. But, oh, we should also add um, that... <laughs> Richard Glover, who was in a field in England. Oh, yeah. Um, a good friend of ours as well. Um, and someone whose short film Monster is actually mm. on our channel mm -hmm. as well. Um, directed by Bob. So do be sure to check that out as well. So Kill List is magnificent. And at that time, I really hoped Ben Wheatley would continue to excel in producing mysterious arty films. Mm -hmm. High Rise perhaps represents a watermark where he could become the British, the new British Stanley Kubrick mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. And it feels like he gave up too quickly. Mm -hmm. If High Rise was mixed in its feedback and if he was angry, as, as, as we saw from the press release and the statement, 
was that really the time to throw it away and uh, to try and make almost Tarantino-esque comedies mm. like Free Fire and then subsequent struggles and disappointments? Um, the film industry is tough. You don't get to make what you always want. So there could be all kinds of financial reasons. Mm-hmm. It could just be that kill list and I feel in England don't pay the mortgage. You know, yeah. These are small films. Yeah, they might have paper budgets or whatever, but it's bullshit and mm-hmm. the money's never really there. Maybe it takes the Meg to, to pay the bills. But if it does, and I hope Ben Wheatley does have his bills paid, then the result might be that he gets to return to creating more artistic films, where I really think his talents shine yeah. most. Certainly in a much greater way than my own film accomplishments can be. And obviously yours. Mm. Aww. So, <laughs> Aww. so I would give uh, Kill List nine coconuts. <laughs> well, we're still going with this. Okay, uh, I'd, I'd give it 9.5 coconuts. 9.5 coconuts. I would maybe give Kill List 9.6 coconuts. 9.5 still. So thank you all so much for watching. Um, Please be sure to subscribe, like and share our video. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you again and goodbye. Goodbye.